Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good evening. And uh, welcome to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Um, to what we hope will be a, a very exciting and interesting um, event. Before we get going, if I could just uh, run you past a couple of bits of housekeeping. If you have a mobile phone on you at the moment, if I could ask you to turn it to silent, please. Um, that would be wonderful. Um, the second thing to note is that we are live streaming this event, um, and there will also be some photos being taken for publicity purposes as well. And the last thing to mention is that if the fire alarm does go off tonight, um, our uh, fire exits are the door you came in through and this door here. And please remain calm and seated and we will lead you out row by row from the back and the front, all the way down the stairs, out through the main door, and we'll meet up by the big tree. So um, a very exciting evening tonight. Um, since our inception, uh, when the museum opened on June the 30th, 1860, with Charles Darwin's great debate, um, the great debate between the Bishop of Oxford and Thomas Henry Huxley, um, and the first one on Charles Darwin's newly published Origin of the Species, we've recognised the importance of and tried to encourage public discourse um, and debate of scientific theories in society. And it's probably now more than ever, um, with the biodiversity and climate crises that we're facing, uh, now more important than ever that we, we have those conversations and we have those, those discussions. Um, so um, it's great to look forward and, and, and discuss the great challenges we face, but also possible pathways to the future. Um, so when our friends and colleagues at the Levy Hume Centre for Nature Recovery approached us and said that um, they could organise a debate um, if we would like to host it between two wonderful speakers who have spent very many years thinking about these pathways. Um, obviously, we were delighted. So we'd like to thank the, uh, the Levy Hume Centre for Nature Recovery for helping to organise this, and to our speakers as well for taking part. Um, just as in the Bishop and Huxley's day, uh, scientific debate can raise passions and it can stir controversy, and that's rightly so when the implications can be so far-reaching um, across society. Um, and so much can hang in the balance. Uh, however, one thing we have learned from that original debate um, is that scientific debate must be persuasive through empirical evidence um, and as dispassionate as possible. And thankfully, gone are the days of asking which one of your grandparents is a monkey. So, luckily tonight we have a chair who is internationally renowned for her extremely persuasive um, and evidence-led conservation science and the even-handed way in, in which she approaches it. Professor Milner Gulland is, is interested in understanding how social, ecological and behavioural factors interact when they affect key issues um, in current conservation. Uh, she was lead author on a 2021 uh, paper outlining the four steps for the Earth framework um, for implementing global, global commitments to tackling biodiversity loss, uh, which the International Union for Conservation of Nature has voted to support and promote. Um, her research group focuses on, on several themes, really looking at user resource user incentives, uh, planning for effective and socially just conservation, um, and accounting for social ecological system dynamics. Um, they're seeking to understand and improve the effectiveness of, effectiveness of different approaches to designing conservation intervention, both on land and in marine ecosystems. So to introduce our speakers, and the theme of the debate, please join me in welcoming Professor Dame E.J. milder -Gulland. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, the important thing is that this uh, evening is not about me in any way. It's about Alan and George, and I'm very grateful that both of them have uh, agreed to come and share their wisdom with us today. So Alan Savory began his career in the 1950s as a research biologist in Central Africa, where the loss of biodiversity in game reserves and national parks alarmed him. Reversing it became his life's focus and led to a significant breakthrough that became known in 1984 as holistic management. He's the author of, amongst other books, Holistic Management, a Common Sense Revolution to Restore Our Environment, uh, which has just had its third edition quite recently in 2016, and numerous papers and articles He's been honoured by the Western A. Price Foundation for Integrity in Science, the Buckminster Fuller Institute for his work's significant potential to solve some of humanity's most pressing problems, the Banksia Foundation in Australia for the person doing the most for the environment on a global scale. He's president of the Savory Institute, which aims to facilitate the large-scale regeneration of the world's grasslands and the livelihoods of their inhabitants through holistic management. 
Our second participant is George Monbiot, who's an author, guardian columnist, and environmental activist whose current research focus is on the global food system. His best-selling books include Feral, Rewilding the Land, Sea, and Human Life, Heat, How to Stop the Planet Burning, and Out of the Wreckage, A New Politics for the Age of Crisis. George's latest book, Regenerous, Regenesis, Feeding the World Without Devouring the Planet, was shortlisted for the James Cropper Wainwright Prize for writing on conservation. It draws on astonishing advances in soil ecology to explore pioneering ways to grow more food with less farming. George was awarded the Orwell Prize for Journalism in 2022, and in the same year he became an honorary fellow at Borthson College in Oxford. So just to explain what we're going to do this evening, first of all, um, Alan's just going to give us a few slides to set the scene and the context, and then George is going to make a few remarks, both of them will be um, relatively short. Then we'll have a discussion between the three of us, and then we'll open the floor to questions um, until the end. So just to warn the people up top, we won't be able to take your questions if you're up in the gods. And so if you do feel the need for a question, there are still seats, come, you could come down now. Um, otherwise, do stay in the gods if you'd like to. All right, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Alan to come and uh, give his chat. Thank you. Thank you. You all understand that we face uh, the greatest danger ever in our species' lives. And this is biodiversity loss, desertification over most of the world, and megafires now burning and culminating in climate change. These are feeding on each other and spiraling out of control. Uh, science is logical. We cannot break that cycle at the atmospheric level. We can only break it at the level of biodiversity loss and desertification of the world. I put up the world scene here so that you can see the size of the area we're talking about tonight. And uh, the whole of the UK, for your interest, fits in one little desertifying island off the coast of Africa. So if we wipe the whole of the UK off the map, it would hardly affect us in this global threat to humanity that we face. Now, an Oxford think tank some years ago published a paper on the greatest dangers to the human species, and one wasn't climate change. I read it with great interest, and their reasoning was that some parts of the planet will still be inhabitable. That means billions of people dead, our cities failed, and tragedy beyond imagination uh, for us. In this problem, the biodiversity loss desertification part of it that we'll be discussing mostly tonight, agriculture, which is not crop production, but is the production of food and fiber from the land's, world's land and waters. All right, agriculture is probably playing a bigger role than even fossil fuels. Now, I became aware of this the magnitude of this problem in the 1950s in Africa and it was because of the biodiversity loss, think of these as dead canaries in the mine, that I was experiencing in Africa on land that we were setting aside as future national parks and you can see the terrible extent of it. And where I live in Africa, surrounded by 30 national parks, they are our worst examples of biodiversity loss, desertification, contributing to mega uh, fires and climate change. Now, we could not blame this on livestock because there were none, there were tsetse flies. We could not blame this on poaching because poaching doesn't cause habitat destruction. We could not blame it on corruption. We could not blame it on corporate greed. We could not blame it on capitalism, colonialism, slavery. I'm just going through the things people have been blaming. We could not blame this on anything. This was under the best of management that the Western world knows how. This was under the policies of World Wildlife Fund, IUCN, Nature Conservancy, all the big environmental organizations of the world. Now that changed my um, whole 
Carrera and I began working on this problem. Now, our belief at the time of all scientists, and had been for 10,000 years and come into science, was if animals are on the land and it's being damaged, there's too many animals. So like all scientists, I proved our beliefs very easily. I was working with some of the world's top ecologists, Sir Frank Fraser Darling, Professors Mosman, Dasman, etc. at the time. And I did the research and proved that this habitat destruction we were seeing in these national parks, this is all habitat destruction, that's my grandson on the banks of a river, the Zambezi National Park, which used to be reed beds and birds and reptiles and everything in my youth and had been for millions of years. So when we were looking at all of this destruction, this is, uh, was the granary of New Mexico, an irrigation-based civilization. This is an American national park. The weather hasn't changed, climate hasn't changed yet. And yet we are looking at this terrible destruction. This is California. Uh, so it's a global problem, as I say, that we're facing. Now, I proved that there were too many elephants. So we had my work peer reviewed, checked by teams of scientists. We all agreed. And my government went ahead and shot 40,000 elephants to bring their numbers down to the level the land could sustain. We were wrong. It got worse. Of all the hundreds of scientists involved, I was the only one that stood up and said, we were wrong. We screwed up. To this day, no other scientist has admitted to error. I then found that the Americans had made the same mistake, done the research. They believed the Navajo sheep were causing the desertification. They had done the research, proved that the sheep were, if they were removed, it would stop the problem. They went ahead and shot 20,000 Navajo sheep and the desertification got worse and their research plots turned to desert. So they made the same blunder as I did. Now what was going on here was not happening in other parts of the world, like the UK, the green parts, etc., like Costa Rica, where biodiversity was returning in national parks. We were seeing the opposite. Now the reason for this was because of a problem called oxidation. In the green parts of the world, which is a very small part of the world, the roof, as you see on that building on the left, is biologically turning into a community. The roof of my home in Africa, after many years, is just chemically breaking down. It's not even a biological process. So we've got two different processes going on, and the cycle of life, birth, growth, death, and decay, has to be sustained. And the decay part of that cycle is as important as the birth part of that cycle. Now with this uh, happening, these are national parks in America. One is the Aldo Leopold Memorial Forest. And you can see the bare ground, the desertification, the oxidation occurring. Uh, with this uh, going on, I accidentally observed some sheep behavior changing during a snowstorm. And I realized, oh my God, the moisture and the microorganisms are in the gut of the animals. And that their hooves and their gut can deal with the oxidation problem. Now, that was an amazing discovery. And again, I had proved wrong because I was more anti-livestock than George's. I was, it made him look mild compared to what I was as a 20-year-old. Now, how were we to do it? I suddenly realized livestock can solve this problem, but how to do it? We'd had 10,000 years. Every single way humans had ever run livestock had led to biodiversity loss and desertification. Then we'd had the last few hundred years of range science, modern science, fencing, and accelerated it, the process. So it had been slower under pastoralists, faster under scientists. I realized that some sophisticated planning process was needed to deal with the extreme complexity of wildlife on the land, livestock on the land, alternative uses on the land. Oh, I'm going to have to carry on. Um, I'll be as quick as I can. I found that what I was looking for, not in any profession, but in the military, and I looked at how Britain had, since the Battle of Hastings, 
dealt with extreme com complexity in the military, and I purely cribbed the technique from Sandhurst of how they planned in immediate battlefield conditions. That worked immediately, and we got biodiversity increasing and desertification reversing. We subjected that to international trials, proved it, etc., but it had not altered the odds of the problem of the national parks. I was then forced into exile because of my role in the country, politically and militarily. And the next four years, uh, in 1979, I spent in the United States. Their government knew of my work, they'd been following it, and the Soil Conservation Service of the United States commissioned me to put 2,000 scientists through training over two years from all government agencies and universities. I would only do it if it was open source because I realized this knowledge was vital for the world. Uh, that gave us an incredible opportunity. It took me from working with pastoralists and farmers to working with uh, bureaucrats, researchers, extension agencies, policy developers at the institutional level. I was aware of the blunders, the 40,000 elephants, the 20,000 they had done. So one hour of every day of the two years of training, 30 people at a time, was spent on nothing but trying to fault the logic or the science in what we were doing. It was an incredible opportunity. I don't think any ecologists ever had of two years of being paid to work with 2,000 scientists from some of the top universities agencies. The, uh, during that, working with these brilliant minds, caring people, we broke through and they encouraged me to write the first edition of the textbook. Now let me just summarize that for you. During those two years, which were the greatest learning of my life with 2,000 people, we discovered the root cause of biodiversity loss, desertification and climate change, completely unsuspected cause. And we discovered that that cause was the way in which governments develop policy. It's that simple. That is it. Now, they brought hundreds of their own policies to be analyzed in the training, and they concluded, it's quoted in the textbook, we now recognize that unsound resource management is universal in the United States. We repeated that in India, Pakistan, uh, in uh, Lesotho, Zimbabwe, smaller samples of scientists, same results. So we confirmed that. We confirmed that humans only have two tools with which to deal with this problem. We have technology and we have fire, and we can rewild. That's just an idea, but like a tool. We confirmed that humans only manage three things, where humans believe we manage thousands of things. We only manage three things, and we cannot manage them independent of one another. And we also uh, confirmed that we could not submit this process to experimental protocols. We could not. So still being concerned that we should not make errors, we then divided into teams of eight, generally, and treated what I'm saying as a hypothesis, even though it was not, it was 100% practical. And we had unlimited time to try to find theoretical ways to cause failure. On average, the teams gave up in four hours. And we could not even theoretically cause failure. So we reason from that then, in practice, we're unlikely to. And so far, we haven't. So that's where we were. Now, to shorten this debate, I hope you'll agree. Let's not talk about carbon from fossil fuels. We agree they should be out. I'm going to propose that we assume that the world's soils can absorb no carbon, so that we don't discuss carbon. It's a side issue. I'm going to assume that cattle don't put out the amount of methane they do. They put out 20 times as much methane. I'm going to take it as a given, an assumption, so that we don't waste time discussing methane. I'm going to assume that every human becomes vegan. We never kill another animal, never eat another animal. We leave them to die in nature and be eaten by vultures, so that we don't have to discuss these side issues and we can focus on the problem. So my contention in this debate is that we need to address the cause of the problem. If we do not address the cause of the problem, we will never solve it. And that when we address the cause of the problem, it will require millions, millions 
more goats, cattle, sheep, ca livestock than we have on the world today, even if we let them die and be eaten by vultures. So now, I'm, uh, it's over to you, George. I've summarized very briefly 70 years of work on the biggest problem facing humanity, and I'd love to hear from you, George, how we can solve this problem with technology. Thank you. Thanks very much, Alan, and thank you, EJ, and thank you, everyone, for coming. Um, so, the title of the debate, and some of you may have forgotten by now, is, um, Are livestock, is livestock grazing essential to mitigate climate change? This was the title Alan chose. I would have tweaked it a bit myself, but let's stick with the title of the debate. In order to demonstrate this proposition, in other words, that livestock grazing can be net negative, three conditions have to apply. The first is that you are storing more carbon in the ecosystem um, than you might otherwise have been doing. And when I say storing, I mean storing, not sequestering. There's a crucial difference between the two. Sequestering is the cycling of carbon into a fixed material, like the soil, for instance, whereas storing is that carbon staying in the soil, if we're talking about soil. Um, if the carbon's just cycling out again, it's being sequestered, but it's not being stored. So you have to demonstrate that you are making a demonstrable, visible change, which can be measured, uh, which is the result of what you are doing in terms of storing more carbon than would otherwise have been stored. And the, the claims being made around um, livestock um, grazing, storing carbon, are concerning soil carbon, that the soil is being stored, uh, the carbon is being stored in the soil. So you have to be able to demonstrate that, and you have to be able to show additionality. In other words, you are adding more to soil carbon storage than would otherwise have happened. The second condition is that you have to show that that level of storage counteracts the greenhouse gas emissions produced by your livestock operation. And that means the enteric methane produced um, by um, ruminant animals, cattle and sheep, um, buffalo, uh, goats are the primary ruminant animals being farmed. Also the nitrous oxide, principally coming from their dung, both those are extremely powerful greenhouse gases. And the carbon dioxide involved in the machinery, the transport, the slaughtering, the processing, the packaging, and the rest of it. So that's condition two, that your storage needs to be greater than your process emissions from, um, pre from re rearing and then um, um, delivering those cattle um, to, to, to our plates. Um, and the third condition uh, is, is uh, sorry, oh God, um, yeah, the, <laughs> um, uh, uh, where have I got to? Oh, I'm, I'm terribly sorry. Um, third. Thir th third condition, yes. Oh, the third condition is that, um, as well as uh, counteracting what could be described as those current greenhouse gas emissions, the methane, the nitrous oxide, the carbon dioxide in processing, you're also countering what could be described as the capital greenhouse gas impacts, which are the carbon opportunity costs of doing what you are doing. And an opportunity cost is the cost of not being able to do something else as a result of what you are doing. So in other words, if you are keeping cattle or sheep or goats on the land, then that land can't be rewilded and returned to a self-willed, naturally functioning ecosystem. So you have to be able to show, on top of those other two things, that you are, are counteracting the losses which would have taken place there. And that's a very tough thing to do, because um, almost all natural ecosystems, wild ecosystems, contain more carbon than any farmed or grazed ecosystem does. So, those are the three conditions. And I've scoured the scientific literature from top to bottom to find any paper in that literature which shows those three conditions being met. I've been unable to find a single one. There is no empirical evidence whatsoever 
for the proposition that, li that livestock grazing can mitigate cl climate change. In fact, there's no evidence that it can even wash its own face in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, let alone be net negative. And this is hardly surprising because there's a finite amount of carbon that can be cycled out of life forms in a grazing system and into the soil. You can't magic carbon out of nowhere. It has to come from living creatures, principally plants. It has to be cycled into the soil and then it has to be kept there. And in order for that carbon to be stored, you generally need an increment of nitrogen. In other words, more nitrogen than is already found in your system because um, soil organic carbon complexes are, are quite rich in nitrogen. There's what's called a stoichiometric relationship between nitrogen and carbon in those complexes. Without the carbon, you can't get the, uh, you can't get, without the nitrogen, you can't get the carbon storage. So where's the nitrogen going to come from? Well, if you apply extra nitrogen, you release more nitrous oxide, which is a powerful greenhouse gas, so you're likely to counteract that. And there are hard physical limits on the amount of carbon that can be drawn down in the soil. And those are set by the potential um, of that ecosystem for recovery, effectively. Because um, natural ecosystems, wild ecosystems, in almost all cases, are richer in carbon. As the great soil scientist Ratan Lau points out, the, the maximum um, um, drawdown of carbon you can have in an ecosystem is the amount of carbon that was lost from that ecosystem when it was converted into an agricultural system or a grazed system. So it's not just that there's no evidence for the proposition. It's not even plausible. There's no mechanism for the proposition either. In order for this proposition to be true, you have to rely not on natural processes, but on magic. In fact, there's loads of contradictory evidence showing that um, grazing livestock systems are a major net loss of carbon into the atmosphere. That there's been several recent papers showing that when livestock are removed from the land, permanently removed from the land, that land begins to sequester and in some cases to store more carbon than was otherwise there. Um, and this is even more the case when we're talking not about systems which were previously grasslands, but systems which were converted from forests into pastures. So, for instance, here in the UK, the government's Climate Change Committee estimates that if you were to allow um, those pastures to revert to woodland, which uh, many of them once were, you would be sequestering below ground, or rather storing below ground, as, as it says, 25 tonnes of carbon um, per, per hectare. And that's not to, to count the above ground carbon in the trees and the other vegetation which would be returning. So what the scientific literature shows, unequivocally and without exception, is that the opposite applies. Far from livestock grazing helping to mitigate climate breakdown, it actually accelerates climate breakdown. But hang on, we've seen the photos. Surely those prove that greenhouse gases are being sequestered. I mean, I noticed that Alan didn't actually talk to the theme of the debate hardly at all. But, but we've seen these photos on many occasions, particularly in his famous TED talk, which shows this is the before and this is the after. This is what happens without cattle and sheep, and this is what happens when they're introduced. So what are we seeing here? Well, it's a very good question, because these photos are typically unlabeled or mislabeled. And in fact, there were a couple of investigations of those photos which showed there'd been the claims being made for them were actually the complete opposite of what those photos really showed. That places which had been devastated were places that had been heavily grazed by livestock, and places in his photos which showed the recovery of vegetation were places where those livestock had been permanently removed. These points have been made to Alan time and time again. It's had an enormous amount of play, the claims that he's made. And those claims, as a result, have been examined repeatedly by scientists and debunked repeatedly. 
not just that there is no evidence for the claims, there is now a very powerful major body of evidence showing that those claims do not stand up. There are several words uh, that we use uh, for what happens when people make a claim for which there is no evidence, or even more make a claim for which, for which has already been debunked. One of them is pseudoscience. One of them is mumbo-jumbo. One of them is woo. But perhaps the most appropriate one in this case is bullshit. Now, as it happens, livestock grazing is one of the foremost drivers of both um, greenhouse gas emissions and, and climate breakdown and of ecological breakdown. Um, a recent paper in the journal Sustainability estimates that um, livestock produce between 16.5% and 28% of the world's greenhouse gases. You'll note that's an enormous range, but that's because we need a great deal more investigation of exactly what's going on in, in these systems. But what we know is already they are highly damaging. Even if you take the absolute lowest range of that estimate, uh, lowest estimate in that range, 16.5%, that's more than all the world's transport emissions. We also know that grazing livestock are far more damaging in terms of greenhouse gas emissions than intensively farmed livestock, horrendous as those are. Uh, there are two reasons for this, partly because grazing livestock tend to be ruminants, uh, cattle, sheep, goats, etc., which produce um, a great deal of enteric methane, which is a very powerful greenhouse gas. In fact, its residency time in the atmosphere now seems to be increasing as a result of the impacts of global heating, uh, making it a still more powerful driver of, of, of climate breakdown. Um, around 30 to 40 percent of all the methane produced by human activities on Earth comes from livestock. But also, grazed livestock grow more slowly um, and, and eat more roughage than livestock which are kept in these horrendous intensive conditions. As a result of that too, they produce more methane and more nitrous oxide. So the worst possible food product in terms of your greenhouse gas emissions is the products of grazed livestock. In other words, pasture-fed or grass-fed beef. And that's Oh, but yeah, okay, that's before we get to the massive carbon opportunity costs. One study um, um, suggests that um, if, if we all went vegan overnight, uh, we would draw down and rewilded the land which was spared, we would draw down sufficient carbon to counteract 19 years of the world's fossil fuel emissions. And then on top of that, there's enormous ecological costs as well. Livestock farming, particularly grazing, is the major driver of ecological destruction on Earth. It's causing three times more deforestation than palm oil is causing. And in some of the most biodiverse places on Earth, in Madagascar, in Ecuador, in Colombia, in Myanmar, in Brazil, in Mexico, in Australia, it's having absolutely devastating impacts. So any story which says it's good to be farming these livestock, it's good to be eating these livestock, is a story which justifies among the most devastating processes on Earth. It is climate science denial. And this variety of climate science denial has grown legs because it is backed and weaponized to a massive degree by some of the biggest corporations, the most deadly corporations on Earth. McDonald's, General Mills, JBS, the Murdoch Network have all been pushing this story that livestock can sequester carbon and help solve climate breakdown. The story is false. When you make a grand claim such as this one, that livestock can mitigate climate change, either you produce the evidence for that claim, or if you cannot produce the evidence, you withdraw the claim. The evidence has not been produced. The claim does not stand. Thank you. Okay, so um, I think, Alan, is there anything you'd like to say in response to that? Yes, just, just, just like quite to quickly, uh, just for yes, a couple of minutes. Yep. I'd just like to say George is absolutely right. There are thousands of papers written, thousands. I've read more than he has. And I'd never found, and George, please tell me if I'm wrong, I never found one that mentioned oxidation. 
I never found one that mentioned the holistic framework developed by 2,000 scientists commissioned to do so. And I never found one that mentioned the military process, holistic plan grazing process. The first step in that is to remove cattle if they're in Brazil, if in the wrong place. It's holistic, it's decision making, management of complexity. Not one of those papers has mentioned it. So how can you produce any peer reviewed paper where the peers were my peers. These are all rain science. I've never attended a lecture in my life in rain science. I'm not a rain scientist. It's not my field. They're not my peers. So you haven't produced one peer-reviewed paper of my work. So Alan, I think just, just to follow up, it'd be quite interesting from both of you to, to get an understanding of what, what you feel counts as evidence. So you said that as part of your um, process, it was agreed by the 2000 scientists that um, experimental science was not the way to address this problem. And maybe you could expand on that a little bit. Yes, I, I will. Um, the Allies won, the Allied leaders won World War II. What did they do? They just had superior planning processes and they used all available science. The holistic management framework that 2000 people helped me to develop, all right, uses a planning process that is totally new to us a new way of making decisions that addresses the cause of the problem and it crosses all disciplines. It uses all available science. So it is not anecdotal that World War II was won by the Allies. You cannot submit it to experimental process. You cannot express any management process, military or anything else, to experimental protocols. We all acknowledge that. Yeah. So George, did, did you want to say something about that? Yes. Yeah, so, um, <laughs> Alan's talking in very broad and mystical terms about something which is, is indeed amenable to scientific evidence. You can measure greenhouse gases cycling in and out of systems. You can measure greenhouse gases being sequestered, being stored. You can measure the balance of greenhouse gases. In fact, there have been a number of studies in which the Savory Institute has collaborated. But even those do not meet the conditions which are necessary um, to meet if livestock uh, grazing is, is, is to mitigate um, climate change. Um, unfortunately, this is a response which Alan has made many times, which if the science does not support the method, it's not the method that's wrong, it's the science that's wrong. I mean, you're on record as saying the scientific method never proved anything. Um, and that you have, <laughs> she says, right, and, that, um, and basically that peer-reviewed studies can't be trusted. Um, what else do we have? We have to measure. You can't see greenhouse gases. You can't demonstrate them in photographs. We have to be able to demonstrate through the scientific method whether something is working or not. And it's all very well talking about World War II. That doesn't get us anywhere towards the resolution of the question of whether livestock grazing can, can store more carbon and more greenhouse gases than it actually produces. That's the question which we're debating tonight, a question I'd really like us to continue to focus on, and that is a question that can only be resolved by scientific inquiry. There is no other way of doing it. So, Alan, maybe you could just talk a little bit about can the I, kinds of outcomes. Yeah, that can you I respond to that? Yeah. I, I recently was talking to a group of 10 scientists in my own country. They had PhDs and so on. And I asked them, I said, you guys, what is the scientific method? And they all defined it hypothesis, tested, etc. They knew it. And then I said to them, what is a peer review process? And they all defined it, absolutely. And then I said to them, what is science? Not one of them could answer. The peer review process is not science. So the experimental process is not science. Science is the gathering of knowledge from all sources, trying to understand nature and in testing them in every way we can, some empirical, some not. Every crop, every domestic animal, everything that made agriculture possible was developed by illiterate people. Where was the science? They were all just observing, deducing. Science is observation, logic, deduction, testing. That is science. So maybe we can just move on to the kind of ecological well, outcomes we focus that you're... On the problem, because George yeah. has asked us to, and yeah. I said, Please, let's assume no carbon can be absorbed so that we don't 
rearrange the deck chairs on the Titanic. Let's assume cattle put out 20 times the methane. Let's assume we're all vegan. Put those aside. Let's not waste time talking about them. Now, how will you deal with oxidation over billions of tons of vegetation every single season over two-thirds of the world's land using technology or fire? Fire is rapid oxidation. The only other idea humans ever developed, and that's 10,000 years ago, was what you're calling rewilding. About 10,000 years ago, we developed the idea of resting the environment to recover. Probably came from pastoralists trying to rest the ground or from crop farmers trying to rotate. And when we, 20, uh, 2,000 scientists trained, I got them, I said, I don't care what university in the world you're trained in, what field you're trained in, I want you to just write every single tool you were ever trained to use in any profession. And then we broke them down into categories and it was fire and technology. We can't even drink milk without technology unless you go to the nearest cow and suck. We can't even drink water without technology unless you go to the river and drink. So we let's, are a let's tool using of, animal. Yeah. Let's focus again on the outcomes. So what, what kinds of outcomes are you looking for from the kinds of management well, that you I'm, do? I'm looking for a way of stopping what you saw up here, terrible biodiversity loss in the United States, Australia, China, all over the place, except here, where we are rewilding, as you're calling it. We're using all of the available knowledge. What is causing that problem is the way that we develop policies. And nobody is asking and saying, well, how do we develop policies? Could, you see, we don't you, even ask yeah. the question. Could, could you ask the question then? What, how do we develop policies? Uh, what we discovered with that group of people was that where we believe we develop policies dictatorially, democratically, scientifically, we found that all governments, whether democratic, whatever, whether integrated scientific teams do it exactly the same way. We have a problem. We're meeting a need, a desire, or a problem. That is the reason for the policy. It's also the context. And then we bring in experts and scientific experts, and they advise us. We have pressure groups that advise, vested interests that advise. We may ask stakeholders to do so. We put together integrated scientific teams, all right? And we develop the policy, and they have adverse results. So common that in e economics, we talk about the the law of unintended consequences, the unintended consequences we get. The reason for that is you cannot take the three things that humans manage. We only manage three things. We manage humans and institutions. I can't make a pencil. I can't make a toothbrush. None of you can. We make it through a corporation. Everything we do is at scale. So we manage humans, and then we have to finance the organization. So we manage the economy. And through those, we manage nature to produce music, art, literature, buildings, food, okay. milk, cheese, wine, computers. We, everything humans do that sustains civilization, we make or produce. So, yeah. George, I mean, I'd quite like to shift to, to scaling, perhaps. So, so we have local um, management, local um, outcomes, and then we have a global food system. So how do you think that it's best to move between those local and the global in these uh, kinds of issues? Because you were talking very globally, I guess, and Alan talks quite locally. And yeah, stuff. I mean, yeah. Uh, you know, you can measure it locally, you can measure it globally. Um, I'm finding Alan's response is extremely frustrating. It's just waffle. Yeah, this has got nothing to do with the question at hand. There, there's a, it's, it's a straightforward question in this debate. The title of the debate is, and it's Alan's title, he proposed it, is livestock grazing essential to mitigating climate change? Either we can demonstrate that or it's not. And these rambling anecdotes about art and music are wonderful. I love art and music. I'm interested in the Second World War. All of these things are great. None of them speak to the question before us. None of them take us anywhere near resolving that question. All we've heard so far about the means by which we resolve, uh, might resolve that question is that those means are illegitimate. The scientific process is illegitimate. Experimentation is illegitimate. Perhaps I could ask you a couple of simple questions. How do you measure greenhouse gases in the atmosphere? Many different ways. Many different ways, and they're being measured. Do you and use the scientific that. process? All of our, and all how of do you measure them in living systems? Please. Well, yeah. 
yeah, carbon in living systems. Take Can it I down. forget? Go on then. If yeah. All of our team, when we did it, said we can measure the results. We've, we've been measuring the results. There have been papers that have measured the results. I'll give you two right away that you know about because you researched them. Uh, Deb Steiner and her co-workers at Ohio State University, they monitored the first American ranchers to start managing holistically uh, from California to Florida. And they found that biodiversity increased on their farms immediately, all except one farm. And they found that they increased their profit by 300%. Over the same time, 600,000 farmers went bankrupt and suicide was a leading cause of death in the same economy. That was measured result. It's published. There was another so you by, the by, scientific Pete, method another by Keith Weber at uh, Idaho State, NASA-funded study with lots of equipment, and we took um, terrible land. I warned Keith not to expect statistic results within five years. They got highly significant statistical results in the first year just by changing the management. That's all we did. And we greatly increased the livestock and carbon and water increased in the soil. Right. It's being okay. measured. It's being published. So this, com this comes back to my question about outcomes and about kind of small scale experiments that are focused on perhaps biodiversity and um, land cover and George's point around carbon sequestration. So is, that, is there something in those works that you just cited that actually measured carbon stocks and sequestration? Please, uh, wondering. I'm saying yeah. forget carbon. Please, let's get serious. <laughs> let, 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 don't do this. Let's get serious. We are facing biodiversity loss and desertification over two thirds of the world's land. We're a tool-using animal. You can solve it with technology or fire or resting the environment. Everywhere that we've rested the environment, it's led to biodiversity loss and desertification where the rainfall is low and seasonal. You can shake your head, it does. Okay, so what are we left with? Fire, that's rapid oxidation. Then we're left with technology. So I'm saying get serious. Two-thirds of the world's land it's going to swamp you. You're getting the millions of immigrants from Africa fleeing from desertification. You're going to get more, lots more. How can we solve that desertification with technology? You've had 10 years to study my work. <laughs> I mean... So maybe... maybe I, right, wait, wait, wait. Yeah. Can I just say, right. this debate was Alan's idea. The title was Alan's idea. We came here to debate a certain topic. I'm not hearing a debate on this topic. Now, I've spent days preparing for this, reading everything I can get hold of, on top of all the work I've previously done in it. And where is this debate? Where is the counter-evidence? Where is the evidence that livestock uh, uh, grazing is essential for mitigating climate change? We haven't heard a single word of that from you. In fact, you're now telling us to forget it. Given that carbon and other greenhouse gases are the components of climate change as we understand it. Um, if we can't talk about those, you obviously don't want to talk about them. You're saying forget carbon, forget methane. How can we even begin to debate this issue? We can begin to debate it this way, George. If you take all of the carbon issue, etc., take it out of the equation, that's what I'm saying to you. You've still got to deal with desertification. If desertification continues, you're swamped whatever you do. You're swamped. Biodiversity, desertification, mega fires are all happening because of oxidation being the breakdown process over most of the world in the absence of enough herbivores with the moisture in their gut. It's been proven, it's been established, and it's always rejected because it goes against human beliefs. Well. Maybe we can just have a little think about oxidation, because um, I'm not a regional scientist either. So could you kind of explain to us a little bit about the process of oxidation and, and yeah. how it's relevant? Yes, if, if you look here uh, in, in this country, you call it fall, because the leaves fall from the trees. We have, have the same in Africa and all over the world. So if you look at trees, they're either evergreen or they're deciduous, basically. Right? Now, the deciduous trees 
are grazing their own leaves, in effect. If you ring bark a branch of a tree, the leaves don't fall. The tree is cutting off its own leaves. I did a thesis on that long ago. Right? So trees can drop their leaves on the ground where the moisture is high and biological decay takes place and the cycle continues. Now, no grass in the world can graze itself because they co-evolved with herbivores. And that's why their growth points are low, close to the ground, out of harm's way. And so in this part of the world, when your grass grows, it can't graze itself, but it doesn't really matter because you've got so much moisture throughout the year. Your rainfall and the rainfall of Johannesburg are about the same, but you're completely different climates. Okay, so here, you don't see oxidation. Your grass just decays and life carries on. And so if you rest the environment, like I showed you, biodiversity returns, same as in the oceans, etc. Now, if you're in my part of the world, the grass grows up to six foot high when we get the rains, that's four months of the year. Now it goes dry for eight months. And that grass turns yellow and it translocates nutrients down to its roots because most of the plant is underground and it keeps the plant alive and this stands up here yellow. It needs animals to remove it. If there are no animals to remove it in sunlight, it starts to chemically break down and oxidize. That process, as we've seen from experimental plots in California, can take up to 50 years. That blocks the light reaching growth points and it's the quality of the light gets filtered out. Phil did his PhD on that in Argentina and it kills the plant because its buds are not getting light. The trees are staying alive because they shed their leaves. The light can reach the buds. It can't with the grass. So now that grass kills itself and we end up with bare ground, as I showed you, in the Leopold, Elder Leopold Memorial Forest in New Mexico even. Now we saw that thousands of years ago and we said that leads to a problem. And so we burnt the grass. And we talk about the Aborigines maintaining Australia. No, the pollen record shows that the whole of Australia changed from a fire phobic vegetation to a fire dependent vegetation. Desertifying continent. Okay, brilliant. That's really clear. Thank you very much. I think we're at time now to move to the questions. So um, I would really like the questions to be kept relatively short because I'm sure there are going to be lots of them. I'm going to take uh, two or three at a time and then we'll kind of come back and reflect on them. And again, I'll ask people to the uh, panelists also to reflect quite briefly so that we can get through quite a lot of questions. So anyone who wants to be the first wave, stick your hand up. There's one down there. Um, and then we're going to have the woman on the end there. Um, and we'll start there. So just a short question. Yeah. George says there's no evidence of carbon sequestration, but there is. There are, there are farmers in Australia, there are farmers in this country being paid for their net carbon sequestration into the soil, net of the, methanes, the methane coming out of the animals' mouths. How can you say there's no evidence? I've seen it on my own farm. Great. Um, and then the next one along is the woman with the glasses. Hi, um, so uh, I read a few of the studies uh, produced by the Carbon Cowboys, which I think is probably an appropriate name, uh, in America about how um, adaptive multi-paddock grazing supposedly stores more carbon in the soil. Um, all of those studies, so these are used to uh, promote this style of, of management um, for grazing livestock. None of these studies shows uh, the difference between uh, the carbon stored in the soil if it was wild, it's always based on this change when it was uh, conventionally grazed beforehand. So I guess my question is, um, does Alan have any evidence that actually if you go from a wild ecosystem to grazing, it's better versus just changing it from conventional to holistic grazing? Okay, we've got a really nice couple of questions there. So one, uh for George about his own farm, and then one for Alan. So start with George. Thank you very much. Actually, the second question kind of answers the first one. I'm afraid these carbon offsets, like so many carbon offsets, are basically fraudulent. They are not demonstrated. And in fact, um, there is a recent, recent project in Kenya, which the Savory Institute was a consultant for, uh, which has been exposed for the most atrocious carbon credit fraud, supposedly with carbon being sequestered, um, or even stored, but again, just as Jamie has done, the two terms get completely muddled up and people really don't seem to know what they're measuring. People... 
excuse me. Actually, yeah. actually, carbon can cycle out of the soil just as it cycles into the soil. And again, I think this puts, puts your finger on what's fundamentally wrong with these measurements. So, for instance, carbon sequestration is being counted as carbon storage. And there's a whole load of issues, like with so many other carbon offsets, where basically you've got a fraudulent process. It's being driven very heavily. Shell has invested big time in it. Rupert Murdoch is selling carbon offsets from, from his own ranch and promoting it all on Fox News. And yet it just does not stack up. It doesn't stand up to scientific examination. Um, the controls are not being conducted to show what would happen if you weren't doing this. So you're not proving additionality, which is absolutely crucial in, in, in any um, um, offset claim. Um, and I'm afraid this whole thing is likely to fold like a pack of cards soon, as so many other carbon offset projects have. If you are buying carbon offsets in a cattle ranch, you might as well be buying carbon offsets in a coal mine. OK, great. Uh, Alan? Well, I, it's very hard, I've found over many years, to get humans to focus on what matters. It's almost impossible. I said, forget the carbon issue, because even if no carbon can be sequestered, how are you going to deal with the mega fires, desertification, and biological uh, uh, biodiversity loss feeding on each other, spiraling out of control? We have destroyed 20 civilizations. Now global civilization is under threat. Focus on the problem. This carbon debate is rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic. Okay, great. Have uh, we got someone at the back? Uh, right at the back there, and then right at the very back. Uh, hello, yes. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm cattle ranching in China at the moment, and uh, we're probably the largest cattle ranching business in China. And uh, we're using Alan's uh, methodologies and actually taking desertified land back into production. Um, and if you've got any sort of problems or you'd like to design some experiments to prove yourself wrong, George, please feel free to pass them to me and we'll conduct those experiments for you. That's an excellent offer. Thank you very much. Uh, once back. Uh, thank you. Um, I came here, to, I was hoping to have a good argument against uh, George Monbiot, but actually I think I agree with him. I'm not sure what we've been talking about this evening. Um, it's a bit disappointing. Uh, a couple of figures and then a question. Uh, both of these may be subject to fraud. The government.uk website from a couple of years ago estimates that converting land to crop results in the release of 12 million tonnes of carbon emissions, uh, whereas converting to pasture is responsible for storing or sequestering 9 million tonnes. Um, uh, the Columbia Climate School estimate that soil has lost 50 to 70% of the carbon it once stored. But either way, given that Alan actually doesn't seem to want us to talk about uh, any of that, something that we're missing from this discussion, as well as saving the world from climate change, how do we feed it? And how do we feed it if we eliminate an entire food group from what we're allowed to eat? Okay, great. And um, we've got uh, the, the guy, uh, Chris, the guy who just came down the stairs. Thank you. I'll, I'll say. Thank you both for coming uh, into this lecture hall where I actually spent many hours studying chemistry. George, do you recognise me? We, um, so we had a little walk around FAI Farms, which is very close by, with uh, Christopher and Silas. And all I wanted to suggest was that we repeat this out in the field, surrounded by cows. I thought it'd be really fun to have a look at the land and sort of see what Alan's talking about and see what George is talking about on the land. So perhaps FAI Farms and Nep Estate and any other farms. I would offer my own farm uh, where we have cattle running around, but uh, yeah, they might not be too happy about that. <laughs> OK, I'm just going to repeat the questions um, because it's a little bit fuzzy on the mics. So we had an offer of a randomised control trial in China, I think, which would be great. We had... Um, we had an offer of a, uh, a walk around some farms to see things on the ground, which would also be lovely. And we had a, a question around how does all of this relate to the global food system? So I think we'll take that question 
And we'll start with Alan and then George on the global food system. But the global food system, it's critical. Without agriculture, you cannot have a choir, you cannot have an orchestra, you cannot have any business. It is the basis of civilization. Without agriculture, you cannot have an economy. There will be no business in the world that is sustainable, no city that is sustainable, until agriculture is reversing biodiversity loss and desertification. It is absolutely critical, and that's what I'm talking about. We need to do that, and the reason that agriculture is the most destructive industry in the history of the world in all countries, the United States more than anywhere, is because of the way governments are developing policies. I had to be president of a political party before I learned that. Um, well, so there's, there's a study um, in science, for instance, which shows that if we were to switch to a plant-based diet, we could release about 78% of the land from agriculture. In other words, you could have um, a massive opportunity for rewilding um, the planet. And I think we've got to the point now where that gives us just about the only remaining option for preventing the sixth great extinction and indeed for drawing down much of the carbon dioxide that's already been released into the atmosphere. Uh, what it found is that you know, not only do you cut out the huge amount of land, the vast majority of farmland, incidentally, which we use for raising animals, but you would also but manage to um, reduce your arable land area by 19% because um, we, we wouldn't be growing the feed that animals need, um, uh, the animals that are farmed intensively. And we would, um, when we eat that food directly, um, we, we require far less growing in order to produce it. Um, now, of course, most people aren't yet ready to make that transition, sadly. Um, and so what I want to see happening is far better development of good substitutes for animal products. And I think we're on the cusp of a massive revolution in this respect. Because for 12,000 years, we've been um, uh, uh, perfecting, uh, or at least pushing to the limits of efficiency, the farming of multicellular organisms, of plants and animals. But we've scarcely begun to develop the farming of unicellular organisms, which has a truly vast potential to feed the world with absolutely minimum in environmental impacts. And so we, we have enormous scope for producing food and also enormous scope for restoring ecosystems and drawing down carbon from the atmosphere. And it's really hard to see how we're going to get through this century or those that follow unless we maximise those options. Great. OK, so we're going to have the guy in the green. He's been very patient from the very beginning, right in the centre. Thank you. Uh, yeah, hang on, we need, we need it because it's online, so we need to have the mic. Yeah. Thank you. Um, simple question. A major source of atmospheric methane from agriculture is actually rice farming. Mm -hmm. The solution is not to rewild all the thousands, tens of thousands, millions of hectares of uh, rice farming land in Asia. It is surely to develop systems whereby the production of methane by rice farming is reduced by the application of scientific methods of uh, investigating um, the system of farming. Likewise, is it not the case that the answer to uh, methane production by livestock is also not to rewild half of uh, Britain and Europe, and North America and so forth, but to develop systems like, for example, regenerative farming, uh, whereby livestock production and uh, crop production is integrated into a simple system that uh, preserves and reduces the amount of carbon that is pumped into the atmosphere. Okay, great. Um, so, hang on, can you push it? Uh, the, the guy in the blue shirt, I see, uh, I've got five. The guy in the blue shirt, that's down here. Um, I see Nat, and I see you after that, and I see you. So. Um, I absolutely agree with Alan Savory that we should concentrate on biodiversity and not carbon. So I hope you'll excuse me if I just challenge George Monbiot on something that he said that uh, 
trees planted on temperate grassland would lock up more carbon than the partial wood. The IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, which many of us would agree is the highest authority on this subject, has, has produced a beautiful graph showing that well-managed temperate grassland will lock up much more carbon, and I use the word lock up um, carefully, because they then go on to, ch to, to say what exactly sequestration means, but I won't, I won't go into that, uh, than uh, trees can. And how do you manage grassland? You put livestock on it. But it's in incidental, but it's, the, yeah. So, Alan, did you hear both of those? Yes, yes. Um, We'll hear that last one there, and then we'll have a, these two after that. I'm picking up on a very similar point, actually, that uh, the, the talk of rewilding and Alan's principles are actually almost two sides of the same coin. If you want to rewild, what Alan is talking about is doing it in an intelligently managed way. And it seems to me that the two are not mutually exclusive. So um, I just, my question to George, really, I suppose, is surely there is a place for livestock in that rewilding process? OK, so we've got a nice bunch of questions there. OK, thank you. Yes, yeah, so um, three questions. Uh, let's start with the last one. Um, you can use livestock in some circumstances as a conservation tool. And a famous example here in the UK is the NEP wildland, uh, where they have um, cows and pigs um, grazing in the land. And they also have a significant recovery of nature taking place. But what people tend to overlook, forget, uh, push under the carpet, is that you've got tiny numbers of livestock involved there. NEP produces 54 kilograms of meat per hectare per year. If we turn the whole of the UK's agricultural area over to um, um, NEP style of, of rewilding farming, um, we would each have 75 um, uh, calories of meat per day, per person, and nothing else to eat. It's a formula for global starvation. And in fact, these two completely different things, livestock production systems and very low level conservation grazing have been conflated and we justify the first one with the second one. But they are completely different systems and we should be really careful not to confuse them because what we're talking about here is a massive industry with a huge amount of global investment and finance behind it and a very rapidly expanding industry, an industry which is now eating into some of the most precious habitats on Oops, uh, 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 destroying those precious habitats, being driven above all else by the demand for grass-fed beef. That's the thing which is the greatest driver of habitat destruction on Earth today. And it can't, the productive system cannot be reconciled with the protection of natural ecosystems. On the question of grassland, um, so the reason why grassland has a greater potential than, than forests for sequestering carbon is there's a lot more grassland on Earth than there is forest. That's what the... I no, no, no. And, uh, well, uh, we'll have to look at, compare those figures because I've got stacks of figures on this. But what is, is clear from paper after paper is that the best way of, of realising that potential is to get the livestock off. Then grass, uh, we, we, I can show you, you're shaking your head, but I can send you the references. In fact, I'll post references up for everything I've been discussing. Um, grassland sequesters more carbon when the livestock are removed. And uh, again, you know, if you've got peer-reviewed papers showing the opposite, send them to me because I've not been able to find them. On, on the third... Yeah, quickly on the rice. On, on the third one, on, yeah. on the rice farming, look, there are various proposals for reducing the enteric methane from cattle um, and that some of them have been demonstrated not with animals but in flasks in the lab the latest one is feeding them daffodil extract and stuff none of this has been demonstrated in, in the real world and it's an instance of what I call guillotine syndrome look we produce a slightly more efficient way of doing what we were doing oh yeah but we're still cutting off people's heads right. you know, livestock farming remains a catastrophe even if you can slightly tweak the enteric methane um, emissions that it produces. I'm going to move over to Alan because there's so many people who've got questions. Alan, have you got anything? 
Well, I'll just add a couple of things. I'm, I'm not going into the carbon debate because it's rearranging the deck chairs, other than to just remind you that the great grain growing regions of the world are former grasslands and not forests because forests are part of the ambient carbon cycle and grasslands are part of the sequestration. It's as simple as that. And, uh, now, we still are avoiding the problem all the time. Unless you deal with the cause of a problem, you cannot solve it. If I've got a headache because Jody, my wife, is hitting me on the head every hour, it's no good me taking aspirin. And if I take the aspirin and I still have the headache because she's still hitting me and I ask for codeine, I still have the headache, so then I'll ask for Panadol. Now I've got blood pressure problems, etc. All I'm describing is what we're doing. Nobody, even here, seems to be interested in talking about the cause of the problem. Unless you solve the cause of the problem, this is meaningless. Okay, so, great. And um, none of this is there. Yeah. If I could just, so, j just please add just this briefly, here. Yeah, we've got a forest of hands, but go for it. Yes, please do. Yes. Unfortunately, the solution or the way to solve these problems I've just written a memoir, my memoirs, could never have been developed by one person. It could never have been developed in any university or any one country in the world. It came from a certain set of circumstances. At the dying of the empire, the end of colonialism, war, I spent 20 years in war because biodiversity loss means poor people, poor land, social breakdown, war. I spent 20 years of my life in, in that war trying to solve this problem. It could only come from that and then exile and working in Americas. And so it is a simple thing in the end, but could never have come from our thinking in any one place. Great. OK, thank you. Wow. Um, so first, Nat. Um, hi. So I really appreciate kind of the, the, what you just said, Alan, about um, you can't treat the problem without addressing the cause. But I think that if we're talking about biodiversity loss, a huge driver of biodiversity loss is climate change, which is driven by carbon and greenhouse gas emissions. So um, if you're not willing to talk about carbon, then we're not going to get to the, the solving biodiversity loss. So what, what do you think is that driver of biodiversity loss, if not climate change? She says, what's the driver of biodiversity loss, if not climate change? OK, uh, take okay. it to the front. Climate change. Oh, hang on. We'll just, we'll just do a few okay. and then... Um, so, front here. Hi, yeah. Um, question for George. Um, if we're thinking about uh, cellular agriculture, all these kind of new, different ways of making calories, basically, for the world, they're all very capital intensive and they take away power from people currently working potentially in small scales on the land and give it to people who already have a lot of money and can afford to pour that money into research and then owning machines. Do we just have to accept that redistribution of power, even greater centralization of power to solve our problems or is there a way around that? And the next one I'm going to take is the uh, green t-shirt, just one in. Yep. Um, I'm going to suggest something I don't think either of you are going to like. I think you agree with each other. Um, I think you've both identified the problem as the combination of policy context and its interaction with how we farm. And I think you both think that the solution is biodiversity gain and healthily functioning ecosystems. Uh, George, I don't think you've really addressed whether rewilding will work on the arid plains of Africa. It, unless with large herb herbivores grazing, which at that point, is it any different to livestock management of grassland? And Alan, I don't think that you've shown that livestock grazing will increase biodiversity everywhere. For example, I don't think you've shown that it'll work in the UK. I think you've found the same problem and the same solution and that you're proposing getting from one to the other in completely different places with completely different solution, like ways of getting there. I think you agree with each other. OK, great. <laughs> Did you get that? So, um, so just to paraphrase, uh, how can you solve biodiversity without climate change? Uh, issues around power redistribution, if we capitalise and centralise, and um, are you both basically saying the same thing? So, 
Um, sorry, I've got hearing problems at my age. I'm in the departure lounge and I run on batteries. Um, let me respond to the one I heard clearly. The biodiversity loss, that began about 100,000 years ago. It began when an omnivorous scavenger with language and organization became a predator and didn't act as any other predator ever has and found that it was easier to kill whole herds than to isolate one animal as pack hunting predators do. And that led to 80% of the genera on most continents being wiped out and their role being replaced by fire. Uh, it accelerated when we went into the Copper and the Bronze Age when our technology could advance beyond sticks and stones and everything in this room was made possible by fire, that accelerated. So it began long ago and the reason has always been the same, the way humans made decisions. The, uh, did I hear that what I'm saying means livestock would be used everywhere? Was it, did I hear it correctly? No, I don't think so. I think she was saying that um, you've, you've produced a really good case for Africa and George has produced more of a case for the UK. But let's, let's move on to... No, I, I, could I correct that? Uh, yes. Yes, I'm just saying you've got a toolbox You've got technology in it, you've got fire in it, and you've got leave nature to recover on its own in it. I'm just saying if you don't put livestock in that toolbox, it is impossible to save civilization and humanity. That's all I'm saying to you. George. Well, um, addressing the questions, um, <laughs> On the um, issue of, uh, 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 of precision fermentation, which is what I'm talking about, really, I'm not talking about what's called um, uh, cellular meat production. That, that's a different technology. Uh, that there is a real danger. You're absolutely right. You know, this is capital intensive, at least in the initial stages. I'm hoping that you know, once the technology is, is out there, like so many technologies, it becomes cheaper and cheaper and more accessible. But there's a real danger of its capture by corporations through... Um, strong intellectual property rights and, and right across the economy. Intellectual property rights should be weak and antitrust laws should be strong. You know, we need to break up big corporations in the existing economy, let alone in the future economy. And already, unfortunately, in the food economy, we have massive concentrations of power. I mean, four corporations control 90% of the global grain trade, for example. In the meat trade, we've got very similar concentrations of power. Really huge corporations. We like to create this impression that it's all run by small farmers with a couple of cows. But, you know, the sort of farming we're talking about here, ranching, you know, is very much dominated by extremely large operations, a huge amount of capital behind them, um, uh, roughly 30 times as much capital going into meat as is going into any of the new technologies, all combined. Um, and and we're you know, facing up to uh, the massive consequences this is going to have on people and planet as a result of that power um, uh, basically trampling over all environmental concerns. And unfortunately, one of its most effective weapons is greenwash, is the bullshit industry. And, and a really powerful element of that greenwash is this new thing called regenerative ranching, formerly known as ranching. OK, so we have uh, time for two more questions. And the first question will go to the person waving in the middle. And the last question, the very last question of the night, will go to the small child at the back. So. <laughs> Not so Can you hear me? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. Um, firstly, there are long-term studies by Rotham Sud Research and um, and others uh, showing that um, loss of biodiversity, particularly insect life and earthworms, and also uh, degradation of the soil uh, due to crop production. And if you lived in the east of England, as I did for many years, in Lincolnshire and the areas around there, the main crop production um, region of the, of the country, and I worked there as an agricultural advisor, you would see that it's crop production that causes the problem. I noticed that George likes to live in the west of the country where all the livestock and the grass is, rather than Spalding in Lincolnshire. Um, so, uh, and the question is, um, 
we've seen that the removal of livestock from the east of England oh, since the Second World War has been the cause of the degradation of the soil and the loss of biodiversity. And particularly the pesticide use in this country is almost entirely on crop production and this is causing uh, the problem. The other thing I'd like to just ask is George, uh, George's um, saying that there is evidence that the livestock sector, which is of course a completely nonsense term, um, it, it's down, is um, down to, um, it's more than the, the emissions from the, the um, transport sector. We know that those reports, those the, uh, whole life cycle analysis are in, entirely flawed and that's been pointed out by many people like Professor Ian Schoons at Sussex. Um, there are no whole life cycle um, uh, analysis of crop production. What they do is they siphon off the um, fossil fuels used in transport of crops and um, and also the fossil there, the fuels. Really so how d and Question. and there is no real evidence. So most, of, George mentioned about the... Um, Can we move to questions, sorry? Yeah, so there is... Um, so what ev evidence... The, um, so I'm asking George um, uh, that there is that evidence um, and there is... Um, if you please provide a whole life cycle, the IPC does not provide a whole life cycle um, for crop production that includes transport fossil fuels emissions um, and and also the fossil fuels used in you know farmers are using m lots of fossil fuels for crop production Thank so you. it's the All right, evidence so, so is there a whole life cycle assessment of for crop production is the question and we've got the last word just from the um would you want to stand up so we can all see um this is a question presumably for George. If you take away the animals, you are stopping the cycle of their waste entering and fert fertilizing the soil, and the microbes in your waste, there are more, and if the, ro and if there are, and the rotten plants, the waste that you get from them, you'd have, you'd have better and healthier plants by using the waste made from animals. Did you get that? The waste from animals makes the plants healthier. So you need to have animals for the waste so the plants are healthy. Okay, so um, great. Thank you very much for those two questions. And now I think we'll just move to... Um, Should we answer the Well, yes. Go on, answer the two questions. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll be as brief as I can. First of all, yes, we need to produce fewer crops. We need to cut back on crop production. By far and away, the best way to do that is to stop growing crops to feed to livestock. Almost half, almost half the... Almost half the world's arable area is used to produce crops to feed to livestock, including many of the areas in East Anglia. How do we stop that? The poultry is... Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, well, even grazing livestock, I'm afraid, generally have a great deal of supplementary feed. In fact, in fact, in the US, in fact, in the US, in the US, um, the great majority, the great majority of cattle in the US are finished in concentrated feedlots. Um, even in the UK, a, a lot okay, of grazing livestock are fed so with supplementary well. feed. Um, with one minute to go, so okay, let's and, move and on to the, the okay, last question. All right, uh, last question. Um, look, th there's a story goes around that, you know, we need to be recycling manure from animals into the soil in order to grow our crops. Um, and I can quite understand where that story comes from, but a, a recent study shows that um, the nitrogen losses from manure are 37% greater even than the nitrogen losses from artificial fertiliser. This system is absolutely devastating in terms of both eutrophication of living systems and in terms of nitrous oxide emissions. And it has to be continually plugged by donations of nitrogen from elsewhere. If you look at the Soil, uh, uh, soil Association's organic standards, they allow arable farmers to bring in 
um, um, uh, manure from conventional farms in order to plug that nitrogen gap. In other words, they're using artificial Harbour Bosch nitrogen and they can use it as long as it's gone through someone else's animal first. There's a huge, huge raft of issues here which we're just not focusing on. We're, we're focused on the pretty pictures. We're focused on the stories. We're focused on what we want to hear. But we have to focus relentlessly on the numbers, on the science. These huge issues, like the issue we were supposed to be debating tonight, can only be resolved by scientific evidence. If the evidence is not there, you cannot make the claim. OK, I'll give the last word to Alan. Thank you. Um, as I said at the beginning, if we all became vegan, manufactured meat, etc., expect a lot of troubles. Right across North Africa, up into China, Mongolia, Australia, etc., we've got millions of people. 95% of the land can only feed people from animals. We can't plant trees, the rainfall is only 200, 300 millimeters of rain. You're going to get millions of immigrants, so expect the tide if we do that. We're not addressing the cause of the problem, so expect a lot. Everything George expressed of concerns, I share his concerns, but he was expressing symptoms of current policy. And he opposes changing the way we develop policy so that we don't discuss those symptoms and we solve those problems. At the moment, all policy is developed to meet a need, a desire, or address a problem. You cannot reduce the cultural diversity, our economic diversity, and nature diversity to that. So when we do it differently, we use a new concept. It's not in any branch of science. It's not in any religion in the world. It's not in any philosophy in the world. It was the hardest thing for us to discover. What could there be the context for a policy? We will always have the same reasons for the policy. And if I might read you out the generic one I use, it'll give you an idea, right? And if you can relate to this, I've found people in India, Yemen, everywhere do. Instead of having the problem be the context for the policy, it would become something like this. We want stable families living peaceful lives in prosperity and physical security while free to pursue our own spiritual or religious beliefs, adequate nutritious food and clean water, enjoying good education and health in balanced lives with time for family, friends and community, and leisure for cultural and other pursuits, all to be ensured for many generations to come on a foundation of regenerating soils and biologically diverse communities on Earth's land and in her rivers, lakes and oceans, and to have a good attitude, being open, tolerant, not judgmental, honest, respectful, to ensure mutual respect and support in team humanity as we learn to live with ourselves and our environment in harmony. This is the greatest war ever fought. And it's the last war ever fought, to learn to live with ourselves in harmony and with our environment. And I am all for stopping these sort of arguments and just concentrate on the cause and unite team humanity. Because every time I point a finger at you, they're three pointing back at me. Every one of us is part of this problem. I do not know you. I'm meeting you for the first time. I know one thing about you, and I'm not a magician. I know how you made every conscious decision in your life. Now, how could I know that? because every human does it the same way, and it is the cause of the problem. Just deal with that. So. So we're going we're gonna to wrap up now. Um, I think uh, we could all get behind the idea that we need to deal with root causes and we need to have better policy, and I would add perhaps better policy based on evidence, however we define evidence. Um, so thank you all for coming, thanks for your questions, and thank you very much to Alan and to George for their um, contribution.
Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It just leaves me to thank as well. Thank EJ Milner-Gullen for chairing the debate so fantastically and also to... Uh,